So um, let's start with an easy question. Just go down the row. How would you define the word casual? <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Uh, great questions, Andrew. <laughs> Terry, you want to handle this one? <laughs> um, I'm not even touching that. Okay. Uh, how would we define casual? I think it's um, the way these people interact with each other and, and their sort of uh, kind of anything goes attitude, but at the same time, um, everything means something to them and they're trying to pretend like it doesn't. Anybody else want to weigh in on it? <laughs> so, Xander, since you, uh, since you took that one, um, how did you sort of come up with the idea for this show um, in your yeah. deep brain there? Um, well, I was living with my sister, and we're very close, and uh, she's, <laughs> yeah, not this close, but we're close. <laughs> and she's, she started dating a good friend of mine um, and ultimately moved out of my apartment in with him, and so I wrote this show to get back at them, and uh, <laughs> I didn't think it would, I didn't think it could get made because these shows, um, they're hard to get made, and then thankfully Jason and Helen took to it, and this sort of uh, dream was imagined, and we got to make it. So Jason and Helen, then what uh, sort of appealed to you about this show? What brought you to the table? I don't have questions. Yeah, you do. <laughs> oh, damn it. <laughs> I thought I was going to get out of that. Uh, it was Xander's voice. It was just so uh, specific and uh, original and really it was just very clear from the first time we read the script. Jason? Oh, uh, you know, I, I feel like there's, there are a lot of talented writers, but there are very few original voices. And what I find, you know, Helen and I get into this conversation all the time. We read a script and we go, God, the writing is really good. Um, but very seldom is it, I've never heard this voice before. This is a new person. This is someone, you know, that I would want to watch. And I felt that, you know, when I read uh, Juno for the first time and I felt like I read Diablo's voice, I went, I, I'd, I've never met this person before. And I felt the same thing when I read Casual. And Helen and I had been looking for an opportunity to work in television. It's impossible not to be in love with everything that's happening in this business right now. And when we saw that script, it was kind of like, oh, here it is. And um, so Michaela and, and Tommy and Tara, as actors, when you first saw the script, what was your first reaction to it? Um, I, I just, when, when I was reading Laura specifically, um, she seemed like somebody that, pe people that I knew in high school. Like she, she seemed like a really fully fleshed out human being, which I think is not terribly common when you're writing teenage girl characters. And so I just, it was, it's a credit to the writing. Um, and of course, <laughs> Jason was attached to it and I'm a, big, I'm a big Juno fan and a big up in the air fan. So that was, was, was nice. Um, but it was also just <laughs> lucky that the script was actually really, really good. Yeah, I love that it was funny without trying to be, mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's, it's not a script that'll go just to silly links for, for a joke. And, um, you know, I'd been looking for something that was, you know, comedic, but with, um, with some meat to it. And I mean, and this satisfies on, on all fronts. Um, I, I think in the audition, I walked in and I said to, to Jason and Xander, so when do they hook up? And it, <laughs> it was, um, because I'd never read any uh, relationship like that on the page about a sibling, about siblings, and just the uniqueness of that alone. I mean, yes, of course, Jason, and under the direction of Jason, it felt like it would be in such amazing hands and handled so delicately and respectfully and beautifully. And I've seen relationships where people's primary partner is their sibling, and that, that's made me sad and wistful at the same time, just like the script did. Um, but it's also funny. So, Liz, in the writer's room then, how do you deal with a relationship like that? Is it, do people throw out ideas that are insanely, I don't know how they could be more awkward than what we see on screen, <laughs> but, um, you know, how do you flesh stuff like this out? Well, I think that um, any time you have a, a show, you know, you get a pilot and then obviously you get it into the writer's room and now you have to sustain that concept and, the great thing about this show is it really is a love story kind of between two people that they can be in love, but it can never be in love the way we necessarily think of romantic love. Um, but it's this well that we as writers get to keep kind of, you know, I don't know, diving, diving through, I guess. Um, we assemble a really great group of writers. You know, Xander always says in our meetings, you have to be willing to tell very personal stories. Um, 
we try to, I mean, it sounds silly, but the writer's room is a very, like, safe space, not in, like, a safe spacey way, but more like you can say anything and nobody's judging you. Like, the darker, the more twisted, the better. I mean, everything on the show usually comes out of a conversation where someone's like, well, I did this fucked up thing once. And next thing you know, you're like, I was dating this guy who had no forks, and you know, and then it becomes spoons or whatever. And it's like, and I just thought, you're 35. And he's like, look, I have forks, or whatever it is. Or, you know, we have um, an amazing writer on staff, um, Molly, who has just an endless well of stories about her relationship with her own brother that has a lot of similarities. So, um, you know, the cows, everything just comes out of a very personal stories, and I think that that's what makes the show, among a million other things, unique, is that there's a specificity to the storytelling that I think is very mined from all of our own experiences and um, hopefully feels relatable. I think... A bingo card. <laughs> a bingo card. Can you print one of those out for this season? <laughs> so, you know, in terms of it feeling relatable, I was standing in the back of the theater, um, you know, while the screening was going on, hearing everyone laugh a lot, which is great, because usually it's just me on my couch laughing a lot. Um, but a lot of shows right now, like Casual, are being billed as comedies. They're, they're very dramatic. The word dramedy is avoided in TV a lot more than it used to be. But this is very clearly a drama, but there are no bits. There's no, it doesn't seem like there's comedy written on the page. How do you guys bring comedy to it? Well, our cast is really, really funny. Um, so a lot of the good humor that you see on the screen comes from them doing a little bit between themselves or just a look or something that they're able to do that brings humor out of a scene that maybe wasn't there at first. I think when we write the show, we write it, I think we sort of break it like a drama, right, Liz? Yeah, we, we break it like a drama, but when there's funny stuff that comes up in the room, we're always like, oh yeah, we have to do that too. That has to go in there. And it becomes this combination of, of funny moments in a dramatic storyline. I think for us, the comedy only works if you believe these characters and if you're along for their journey. So if you're invested in the drama, the comedy comes out and it's, it surprises you in ways that I think hopefully makes the show funny. So that's, I guess that's why we categorize it as a comedy, but I don't, I don't really think of it in label terms, comedy or drama. It's a story about people that hopefully you relate to that has sad moments and funny moments and touching moments and all the ways that I think life is supposed to be. I think your hip hop debut should be called Break It Like a Drama. <laughs> <laughs> you all heard the commitment here. Thank you. <laughs> I just got the chills. <laughs> so, um, Michaela and, and Tommy, you've done a lot of comedy. You do come from the comedy world. What do you do on set to inject comedy into these scenes? Or, it, does it just come naturally? Is it direction? You do funny voices. No. Um, but, uh, but. I'll have a spit take. I'll do it. Uh, yeah. Just a, a wah, wah, wah. <laughs> Our girl was here last night. Oh, no. Um, but, uh, and then, and then, and then Jason, like, brings it down. You know? He's like, you guys are here. Um, but it, you know, I think it is exactly what Xander was saying is that, you know, there's comedy where there's like joke, 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 and then there's character driven comedy. And I think um, when I used to teach improv, we do this one exercise where we would, um, I would have the students do a dramatic scene. Like we'd get, you know, an, a suggestion. It would be, you know, 9 11 or something. And I'd be like, okay, you guys are waiting by the phone, you know, something really serious and dramatic. And they would inevitably always be the most funny scenes because nobody was trying to be funny, so it never took you out of it, and you were invested in it, but when something would happen where they would start arguing about, you know, who left the spoon in the sink, it would be so funny because it's a scene about this heavy thing, but they just start arguing about a sp something as insignificant as a spoon, and it, it, would, it would be so real and 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 present, and, and, and therefore, I, I, I don't know, just, just so committed, and, and just basically what Xander just said. And so um, I think we just try to do that. You can see on the page where a joke could be if it was on any other network or under any other direction or voice where you would go, oh, I know what to do with that. But on this, it's an exercise in completely going against that comedic instinct. And if it comes through and you guys laugh, that's just, bon that's just icing. 
No, I think that's right. I mean, I think, you know, it comes out of the, the commitment to it. Xander's being humble. There's, you know, the, the scripts are full of humor. Um, but I think, you know, if you commit to Alex's exasperation, you know, you, you got to go all in. And then, you know, you'll, you'll find the, the humor there. Um, also, these women are so good. We just kind of find that wave every day and surf it together. You know, it's, it's, it, it, that, that comedy exists in the ether but between us. And, you know, it's a rhythmic thing, you know, and, and they have it in spades. And I just do funny looks. I've been trying to do that surfing metaphor for weeks. It, I, it killed. And I finally killed. got it I'm in there. It so, checkmate. I don't know how to continue with that surfing metaphor. Um, but you do talk about this, the comedy coming out of it because it is very relatable. It's realistic. You look at it. You look at, you know, for lack of a better term, the the darkness of the reality of your life and the humor that comes out of it. And um, Tara, you were talking a little bit about these are, this is a teen you know, this is people you know. Um, do you think that the character is how adults see teens or how teens see teens? Where does that come from within? I think, I think the character is written how teens really are. Like she's not really, I mean, I know that sounds like reductive and like it's a cop out, but it, it's sort of true. She's sort of an amalgam of all, all different types of, of like identities that you try on as a teenager. And uh, I think it's, I mean, I've said it before, but, but I think it's so easy to, to make teenage girls tropes. I think it's so easy to write like the sexy cheerleader or the girl next door or like, you know, the, the town bicycle. Um, I think it's, <laughs> that seems like a really dated, t um, is it really all the same role? I'm, I'm, I have a lot of catching up to do. But I feel, I feel like it, I think where, where, what makes Laura a strong character is that, is that she's all of those things and none of those things. Like it feels, it, she just feels like she's a, a real human being and she's cool and you want to hang out with her sometimes and sometimes she's a real pain in the ass and I feel like, like, uh, like it's somebody that I, that I know and would want to hang out with. Anyway, that's my answer to your question. <laughs> I could go on, believe me, I won't. Um. Well, I do want to talk a little bit about season two since we don't have a lot of time and I'm going to assume that a lot of people have, everyone has seen season one or more than once like I have. So um, the season starts with Alex's phase three. Um, what was the decision to leave out one and two? <laughs> I think we, we wanted to get through his, um, his phases as quickly as possible because the show to us works when these people are all working together when they're sort of bouncing off each other, when they're out in the world, when they're doing fun stuff. And it felt like to, to sit and wallow in the early phases of um, him getting over, over this sort of betrayal didn't feel like what the show was or what the show would succeed in doing. So we, we figured if we can get out of this in an episode, we show the sort of surface healing, the, like, the band-aid that's put on this, um, this problem, you get into the rest of it and, and hopefully you forget by episode four, five, six, you sort of forget about the, um, the bullet wound that Valerie has um, inflicted on Alex. And then by the middle end of the season, when that Band-Aid falls off like they always do, then you see all the problems come out and, and you've sort of bought that nine episode investment um, before the shit really hits the fan. So I think we felt like the quicker we could get through it, the more we could give a surface, um, a surface fix. And then when it all comes out later, it just it floods like Tommy's way of analogy. It's like when the, when the tide comes in. <laughs> so to that point, um, when you guys were discussing season two with, with Hulu and just amongst each other, was this the vision you had during season one? Did it change as you sort of saw the cast come together? Um, how did that work? I mean, with... I think during season one, you're never thinking about season two. I think you're just trying to like get through season one and make it great. And you're like, we'll worry about season two when we hear if we have season two. Um, but I think, um, you know, it was actually Jason who was really great in the first episode about kind of, I felt like pushing us to really not wallow, like Xander was just saying, and get back to the core of what the show was um, and kind of 
hurry over that hump, but then in doing so, it gave us such a great art for the season because you know you've stuffed something down, and then you get to tell a story in a really slow way that you know is going to kind of build and explode. So it gave us a really great framework for the season, and I think, um, you know, I think it wasn't until season one was wrapped that we, you know, Xander and Helen and I kind of sat down and talked about um, what we wanted season two to be and how we envisioned it, and um, friendship was a big theme that came out of our conversations. Um, and looking at friendship the way we looked at dating in season one and using all those same kind of tools and neuroses and stresses and desires and wants and putting that into friendship. And so that really became the arc of our, of our season. And always in season two, no matter what network or what the show, um, the note, whether said or <laughs> implied, is expand. You know, expand your world, expand your universe, broaden out their worlds. And so that was really what we set out to do in season two. Um, I heard a little story last night um, about someone potentially expanding themselves. Um, so uh, Tommy is is a big exercise freak, if you will, um, and he did something interesting between two episodes that he wants to talk about. But apparently, um, someone Jason maybe wanted him to gain a little weight, and he did not want to do that. Do you want to tell us about that? Jason just wanted to foie gras me. Just, <laughs> just stuff me full and kill me. Uh, I'm what's called an actor's director. <laughs> <laughs> it's a better question for Jay. I was, you know, excited about the job and all this stuff. And the first thing, first sit down, we do a little table read uh, among the three of us and, and Jason. And Jason kind of with this, um, we finish and, you know, fired up to get started, and um, Jason kind of <laughs> looks at me mournfully and goes, we're going to need you to gain some weight. <laughs> Problem being that um, I was training for the Boston Marathon, which was a big bucket list thing for me, so um, I said no. Now we can kill you. Yay, he did it, he did it. Yeah, right, now that I've done it, uh, if we get a season three, I'm going full Tom Hanks. Um, unrecognizably huge. So nice. um, that's back to the surfing, though. That's the pull quote. Um, I do want to talk a little, we touched on this, but um, I do want to talk a little about why this brother-sister relationship feels so awkward. Um, I know it's designed that way, but why do you think audiences are so uncomfortable with it? That's a good question. Um, I, think, I think for a lot of people, your sibling is your first love. It's the person that you um, grow up with, and you have this formative experience with them, and you feel all these things with them. And then when you hit a certain age, uh, you're supposed to break apart, and you're not allowed to have those feelings anymore, and you're supposed to go find them elsewhere. And I think in our show, it's a show about two people who have hit that point. They've gone off. They've, they've built lives for themselves. They've had kids, relationships. And now they're forced back together in the same place, and I think a lot of those feelings are coming back. And it's something that you don't see in real life very often. I mean, I think most people don't move back in with their siblings. It's like when you hit a certain age, it's done, it's over, and those feelings are supposed to uh, be ignored or go away. And in our show, you can't do that because they're living 10 feet away from each other, and they're spending all their time together. And I think that makes people uncomfortable because you're thinking, this, this shouldn't be allowed. They should go find it with other people. They should go expand. They should go be healthy and happy with, um, with appropriate people. And you know, as writers, it's our job to keep that tension there and the drama there and, and not give them that, um, not allow them to fully break apart. And I think people find that uncomfortable. Michaela, you were, looked like you wanted to say something? Yeah, you said, you said it all. I just, I mean, I think, I think codependence is really uncomfortable to watch. You know, I, I, think, I think we all have it. We possess it, a lot of us. And it's cringy to watch somebody, you know, sometimes see ourselves slightly reflected in other people. I mean, that they that they are, you know, they're. It's like this show deals with this great need, the, not just needs. Everybody has needs. Like you can turn on any show and be like, that character wants this. That character wants this. They all need this. But the need to be needed is so fascinating to me. And nobody, I mean, Valerie particularly does not know her value unless she's needed and now she's divorced her daughter doesn't really need her she's growing up i mean does but doesn't and her brother doesn't you know it's rejecting her in, in ways and i think that's what led her to 
drop a bomb in the first season. But, but, and then when we pick up season two, it's too bad you can't see the second uh, episode, which is up now. But you really see Alex's need to be needed, and that um, without feeling that, they feel valueless. And I think that's hard to watch. You know. I think shows that are a little harder to watch because they're relatable. Now, there are, there are a bunch of those on TV. People are responding to a lot of them. They're on a lot of you know, streaming, and uh, awards are starting to take notice, like the Golden Globes, for example. Um, and I'm, I'm wondering, and I know I keep bringing this up, but the, the combination of being relatable but also making people uncomfortable, why do you guys think that seems to be resonating now? I always think like Valerie is, oh. if between the two of us, like Valerie, everything she does is relatable. I, I mean, everybody's done something awkward socially and all those things. And, and Alex is the other side of that where you don't know, he, you don't know what he's going to do, but it's going to be interesting. And I think even if we look at our political landscape right now, like it's, it's sort of those, that dichotomy shows up in a lot of things. And maybe that's just compelling. I don't know. That's just a theory. I made it up. It's like surfing, guys. Uh, Am I back? <laughs> Sometimes yeah. it's nice to do it alone, but you need a buddy. Uh, <laughs> and you might crash uh, into that buddy, or that buddy might save you from what lurks beneath. Okay. You can bullshit the wave, but the wave don't lie. There's something intoxicating about honesty, though. And when you brought up the political landscape, I think that's absolutely true. Uh, I think there's people that certain people are in love with only because they are so frank, uh, no matter how terrifying they may seem. Um, and um, there's something very honest about this show. And uh, when you talked about the writing, that was something else that I just loved about the writing from the very beginning. And it's a thing that I love about how the actors portray the characters on this show. Uh, there is never a desire to be funny or dramatic, there's kind of a, a, an inherent search for truth that happens kind of in everyone who works on this show. I think I have two minutes left. So um, I am wondering, is there anything that you read when you got a script which shocked you about your character? I, I don't know how anything could as it progresses, but <laughs> anything um, for any of you that suddenly you said, wow, I this is not, this is my breaking point. This is amazing. I can't wait to do this, but. Oh, that changes my answer. <laughs> um, I don't know. I guess, I guess this, uh, has everybody seen the first season? Has, have most people seen the first season? Okay. Oh, I didn't expect, I'm sorry. I didn't. Um, <laughs> uh, so when, when Laura decides to make a sex tape in order to get the attention of her photography teacher, I read that and I was like, oh. Good thing I trust and adore these writers because if it were in any other situation, I would be scared shitless. Uh, but they did it in a way that was so tender and so, and you, she really is just trying to be seen in whatever way that means to her or you. Um, and I think they, they went about it in such a, if I were to make a sex tape, that's how I would do it. <laughs> it's very true to life. Oh. Uh, after episode nine, um, for those of you who've seen the first season, I promptly put it down and had to go, I was in bed and so I was in my pajamas, but then I walked around my neighborhood in my pajamas, <laughs> like a normal person who has cats. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and I just had to like walk it off and then I came back and wrote the writers an email and I just said, wow. Um, in the second season, it is, it, it's just, I gotta say, I just have to say, having, um, you know, really interesting writers and, and women writers particularly, and um, it brings so much, so much complexity, so many layers to female characters uh, approaching 40 that you just don't really get to see very often. And it's like you get to use every gear in on the on the on the sports car now, and women don't normally get to do that. So the thrill of being able to do that this second season has been, and first, but particularly second, has been so so great. Look out for sharks. <laughs> no, I mean, I think one thing, it, it, in the first season, it, it was a Alex's sort of capacity to, like, love his parents was a surprise to me. He'd been so sort of cynical and dismissive of them, and he gives a speech at a wedding uh, late in the season. Um, and 
look, it all it all ends up coming apart, of course. But the um, it it surprised me in a in a lovely way, which which is that you know Alex can be a bit of a dick, and um, his ability, you know, that turn where he gets up and actually sort of half half forgives his his parents is um, was really moving and and unexpected for me. Also, having um, sex in multiple positions with a dog trainer in the room. Um, <laughs> was a highlight of episode three. <laughs> if you don't know how to call a dog during a sex scene, um, let me tell you, it involves a couple spoons, <laughs> some whistling. Um, that seems like the perfect point to end on. <laughs> Thank you guys so much.